Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, no one is perhaps more famous in France than Catherine Deneuve. Starring in over a hundred films, including Belle de Jour and The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, Catherine Deneuve has been described as one of the most beautiful women of all time. Her latest film is the comedy Potiche, which translates as Trophy Wife. She plays Suzanne, a housewife who steps into her husband's shoes to run the family umbrella factory when he is taken ill. Here's the moment her husband returns to reclaim the factory, but Suzanne has other things in mind. Mm. Mais non, Robert, je t'assure. Après les journées difficiles qu'on a traversées, euh, non, ça roule bien. Ça roule même très bien. Et toujours après une grève, ma Susan. D'abord, t'as pas été trop maladroite. Tu t'es assise dans mon fauteuil, t'as pris ton air bonasse. Tu as généreusement accepté toutes les gratifications et toutes les augmentations. Bravo, tu as été remarquable. Mmh. Maintenant, on va remettre sa panoplie de Madame le PDG au vestiaire et puis on va revenir à ses activités familiales et domestiques. Je crains qu'il y ait un petit malentendu entre nous, Robert. Enfin, qui c'est le patron ici, nom de Dieu Moi. Catherine, umbrellas have come back into your career again. After the umbrellas of Sherberg, now married to an umbrella factory owner. Uh, well, actually, he's not the owner. He's the director. It belonged to my father in the, um, in the, in the play, yeah. I say in the play because the film was uh, done after a play that, was, uh, uh, that happened in the, in the 80s in France, um, played by a comedian which I like very much, who I like very much, called uh, Jacqueline Maillan. Right. And it was in the, in the play. Yeah. It was not an invention of Francois Ozon. What was the reason that you decided to have a, a film career and not acting in the theatre so much? It's very different. I you never. Said, but well, I, d I cannot say I really decided, you know. Mm, I would yeah. say that I'm very reluctant because I think I'm afraid. And, uh, but I, I cannot say that I really gave up completely. It's not completely out of my mind. Yeah. I'm sorry, but but, but it, you, it doesn't, it's not so natural to you as film, is it? No, it's not. Yeah, it's right, not. Right. It's a different approach. It's a different way of working. And I've been involved in making films you know, since the beginning yes. and always working. So it didn't really... Uh, I cannot say that it doesn't appeal to me because I go to the theater, you know, as a... I go to see uh, plays and the actors that I know. But it's something that I fear very much. You know, I suppose it has to do with stage, stage fright. But... I don't think it's only that. Stage fright and audience fright, I suppose. And audience fright, yes. Yeah, which yes. is the same thing mm, in yeah. a, sort of, a sort of way. And, uh, and now the title of the film, Patiche, is, mm. is very expressive, but, and I thought it was expressive when it was explained to me, and so yeah. I suppose we should explain it to the folks at it's home. It's almost like Trophy Wife. Trophy Except Wife. Trophy Wife is supposed to be a very good-looking woman that you can show around and, you know, who is really a sort of faire valoir, as we say in French. A potiche is more like a, a big vase, you know, or a be beautiful object that you, a good-looking object that has no other function than to be somewhere on a stool or in a place and to look good. Right. And that, and you in the <laughs> film, you start as a potiche, but you, you yeah, end because up in as French a you can say you say potiche for for someone uh, who doesn't Tr move around or is too slow. You say, oh, you are you you was it in potiche, but it's it's not it's not something I've been called. Very often, I must say, <laughs> a potiche. No. It's a uh, yeah. It's very. It's very French, and it also really says. But men can be potiche as well. Can they? Oh, yeah, uh, because potiche is really like someone. If you use it for like someone, they can be trophy husbands rather than yeah, trophy someone wives. you know that is there sometimes with you uh, or with someone and has no other function to 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 do that. Just be there. And the film is set in the seventies. Is that yeah. because you wanted to show the difference between? where women stood then and, and women today, 30 years later? Well, I, it has to do with that, yes, that's for sure. It has to do with that. But it's also the fact that in the 70s, first of all, visually, you can, you know, you can, uh, it's easier to really show the period of time, 70s than 80s, because 80s is still very fashionable, you know, today. So it wouldn't seem to be so much of a, a period uh, film, you know. Mm. But it's true that also the condition of women was very, very different. Very different. Very right? different, yes. Very Would different. your life have been different if you'd been born in the, the world of today? Did you have more of a struggle, perhaps? Well, as a lot of ago? women, you know, I knew the struggle of being pregnant. 
Yes. And that's something that young people of today don't think twice because, and it's normal, it's part of their life, they don't have to think about it, but when I think about it, it's not such a long time ago, you know, that abortion was considered to be a crime and uh, still is today in some countries, you know, you yeah. still have, even in France where it's, uh, you know, it's not a crime anymore, some people are fighting to get that back, you know, that to decide that, uh, yes, yeah, still in America, a lot of people, in Spain, in Italy, you know, there are always people trying to go back to a, a more uh, st a strict uh, uh, order, you know, of uh, being pregnant, you cannot kill life. Yeah. Well, and you signed that uh, charter that. of 343, 342? Yes, I don't know how you say in English, sluts, you say? Slut, That's yes. That's how they call us, yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. Mm. But, but you've done quite a few things on the periphery of politics without ever going into politics as your I mean you No, I, I didn't get in politics but I got involved in important issues. Issues that were important to me, you know. Mm. Like the death penalty, uh, in America and like uh, um, the 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 mines also, I don't know how you call them, we say mean anti personnel, you know, I was part also of a campaign for that. Yeah. And yes, uh, yes. different things like that, yeah, yes. Yeah. And one you've made so many memorable quotes. Like one I I found here was this you said, I have never achieved the life I imagined for myself <laughs> when I was younger. Achieve is not really a word I use, but... Uh, no, 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 that's, that's <laughs> an Eng English... Yeah, I know, I'm but I don't I've think... I've never you know, managed, or I've never... Yeah. Well, I think that I've been so involved with, uh, with films, and I was lucky enough to get uh, proposed things interesting, you know, when I was young, and it went on. I was very lucky, you know. Mm. I mean, it's not only luck. I mean, you have to do choices. You know, have yes. to, you know, take chances and meet people, and sometimes get involved and do mistakes because mistakes are also part of life. Yeah. But uh, I've been quite lucky, yes. And uh, talking of uh, new woman, people talk about a new woman today, really, as opposed to a trophy wife and so on. Do ah. you think there's a new womanhood today, particularly? No, I don't think there is a new woman, but I think that things have improved and there are more women, you know, in a, at work. A lot of women work, but more women to responsibilities, you know, uh, uh, places and uh, women with uh, more power. Still, it's more difficult for women than men at a certain uh, yeah. uh, place in the, in the business world or politic world to really... You have to prove twice, you know, yeah. your value yeah. Yeah. more yeah. than uh, anything. Yeah. One of your quotes... This sounds like a definitive, definitive quote. You said, marriage is obsolete and a trap. Is that no. your final word on the subject? No, I never said that. You I never mean, I know I've been quoted to say that. I said, no, I don't think it's obsolete. I just don't think, you know, the reason for which marriage was invented still exists because marriage was invented to protect women at a, period of, at a time where women needed, you know, protection and yeah. have a family, raise the children, you know, have that sort of uh, build, build up. But... Uh, I think today it's very different, and actually people uh, divorce very often. I think uh, at school today, at least in France, I mean, there is only one children and three which is, uh, who is still living with both parents. Yes, I know, that's a, mm. that's a major change. Mm. And the figure in this country rockets up in terms of the number of uh, children born completely outside of wedlock. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's over a third. I think that's 40%. Me, myself, I had a child out of marriage. My, yeah, my that was, in those days, it was a daring thing to do. Well, I have twice, yes, but the second time, uh, um, the father of my daughter was still married. Yeah. Which was n uh, inconvenient. Two years earlier, my, two years before my daughter was born, it was not possible to 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 give your name to a, a child out of marriage for a married man. Oh, yeah. hmm? What what with all the characters you played, over here, what what would be your your definition of love? I don't think you can live without love. You know, I think it's like. A, I think it's a necessity, but I don't really think of a, a definition except that it's to also put uh, other people than yourself, you know, in your in your life, you know, giving a lot of place to to people you like and sometimes you love, but liking. Actually, even hating, you know, is part of love. It's a sort yes. of opposite to love, but it's the same, uh, the same strength and the same... Uh, but I don't think I have a very good definition uh, of love. Uh -huh. Someone I asked said that uh, love is staying awake all night with a sick child or a very healthy adult. Uh, it's nice. But it's a pirouette, as we say. It's not really, but it's a very nice way of, uh, of uh, showing two sides of love, yes. yes. But I think friendship also is a, is a kind of love, very important uh, kind very of love. Important. Mm. Yeah, Abs absolutely. 
So what are your plans for the future? You're going to go on hopefully acting, aren't you? You're not going to stop doing that. You're going to keep on doing that. Well, as long as I'm uh, doing films I want to do and I'm, uh, I'm offered parts that I find interesting, yes, I will. Yeah. But it could stop, you know, maybe in a few months or in ten years, I don't know. You'll act forever. You'll act forever. Well, I'm not sure of that. It will really depend on the quality of the parts I propose, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we wish you tremendous luck with this film. Thank too, you very much. I well, hope it's a real wow. I'm sure it is, because it already is in other parts of the world. So. Yeah. Thank bon you chance. very much. Thank Merci. you. The one and only Catherine Deneuve there. Of course, there's a lot more to the movies than the actors. One of the most memorable parts of a film is its music. Award-winning film composer Rachel Portman is celebrated for her scores for films such as Never Let Me Go, The Cider House Rules, Chocolat, and the 1996 Jane Austen film ad adaptation of Emma, for which Rachel won an Academy Award for Best Original Score. The first female composer to do so in that category. She joins me here and now in the studio to tell us about the art of composing for the screen. Rachel, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's sometimes, I suppose, music is almost more important than the acting. Oh, I don't know. No, I think, I think no. my place is always to serve the film and, and make, you know, to, to help tell the story. Yeah. And it's very important as, as a composer of film music, I think, to know that you mustn't steal the show ever. That's a very good point, yeah. yes. What is the most powerful uh, screen music that's ever been composed? A film oh. where it had immense power? Jules et Jim? Uh. Oh, gosh. That, I mean, I think um, The Mission, um, the score for The Mission by Ennio Morricone was a very powerful one. Also, um, The Godfather, Nina Rota. Yeah. Music played a hugely important part. You know, music was a, a character in the, f in the film in that. There have been several brilliant, brilliant. I mean, often in westerns as well, classic westerns. The music can play oh, a very oh big it's part. My favourite film song, yes, from uh, from High Noon, yes. And what about the the sequence of events? I mean, when you talk to Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice about which comes first, the music or the words, or, and all of that. Well, when it comes to comes to a film, sometimes presumably, if it's a late breaking film you may the film may be finished before you see it or are you sometimes are you right there at the formative process when the idea is beginning it's very rare that um, I'm writing music at the same time that the film is being filmed but um, I I do my work usually in the post-production when the film is being edited right and normally I mean it's it, because music has to be fitted so precisely to the film it really makes sense for me to start once the film is towards the end of its um, sort of finishing process in terms of the the cut the edit so that's when I come in and um, so I can try music out and write music to the actual finished picture which is what I work with so that's really that's really when it's vital you've, yep. got, to, you've got to get you've got to get totally well, in sync because the music also it, it it plays such a big part you know pacing is so important so I need to know uh, I need to get the feel of, of, of the scene, you know, where a where music should be throughout, because um, you have to decide where there's going to be music in the film. But then also, pacing is terribly important in the in the overall sort of um, pacing of a film. Uh, music plays a huge part in that of helping things get faster or slower, or you know, sitting back or, you know, mm. it's important. And uh, and how often do you suddenly think? I mean, do you get it right straight away, or do you sometimes think? No, I've taken the wrong direction here. This film needs something different to what I've just done. Yeah, it's it's hard. The hardest bit of the process is the fact that you don't get given a very lot, of, a huge amount of time to do it. It's about seven or eight weeks for each film, and that could have 40, 45 minutes of music that I would need to write. Right. And it's coming up with the theme. It's finding the voice. That's the hard bit. And for the first two weeks, really, you have to write your way into it. And the first the the ideas aren't good at that point because yeah. they have to get refined and that's the hard bit because you know that you're not there yet until you suddenly think, right, I think, I've, I, I think I'm on it now. What's the most moving film score you've ever... I know the, the most moving film that I ever worked on was Never Let Me Go last year, which was so painful and so beautiful. Um, and I, I, it, it was an amazing, amazingly beautif beautifully made film. Uh, very uh, sort of 
economic in its language and such a painful subject and I loved writing music for that because I, I love writing emotional mm. music you know I'm naturally sort of drawn towards that um, so I loved doing that Does music on a movie ever move you to tears? Can music move you to tears or only in synchronisation with the acting? Music moves me to tears far more often um, in listening without films because I'm highly critical of, of, as I think you are if you're in a profession, of other music on films. Um, you know, I'm, I'm extremely moved by actually simple Bach and uh, Ravel and uh, often moved by music. Film music less less so because I, I have such a critical eye on it. Oh yeah, so yeah. Still, yeah. And yeah. what's the next one? Um, the film I'm doing at the moment is called I Don't Know How She Does It with uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. Um, oh. It's a comedy. Comedy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, completely different. G good, clear comedy title. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Thank as you very well. much. Thanks ever so much Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Rachel Portman there, talking to me earlier. Two years ago, Neda Agha Sultan a 26-year-old Iranian woman was shot dead during pro-freedom protests in Tehran. Her dying moments were recorded by other protesters and posted around the world on YouTube, where they've been viewed by millions. Neda's image is now a symbol of the movement for Iranian freedom, and a documentary has just been released here which tells her story, and for the first time includes interviews with her family too. I'll be speaking in a moment to the filmmaker himself, Anthony Thomas, uh, but first of all, a clip from the documentary. I should warn you that from the outset it contains scenes which may upset some viewers. Every conflict of the last 70 years has its own defining image. Vietnam, China, Iraq, and now Iran. June 20th, 2009, a young Iranian woman is shot in the heart by a sniper. A woman, this murdered woman, suddenly became the symbol of everybody else that was murdered by the Islamic Republic. The voice which you're hearing, that's calling her, Neda, please, Neda, please, it's like the no, stay with us, don't go. I mean, this is just so shocking. She started looking, like, looking to the camera, looking to us. L look, I'm, 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 I'm dying. Look, I'm dying. I was killed. And she died with open eyes. This was amazing. Indelible, indelible pictures there. Anthony Thomas is here right now. How did you and the film about Neda get together? How did you find out about the story? Well, I saw, oh. I saw that footage. And what, it, on YouTube? Or something? On, yes, I saw yeah. it on YouTube and was deeply upset. I can't claim credit. Sheila Nevins, who runs the documentaries at HBO, immediately called me to New York, and she said, Anthony, I've got a challenge. I want you to change that from a symbol to a living human being that we know and understand. I want to understand what she was up against. Can you do it for me? Well, it's a long story, but I'll shorten it. I managed to get contact to her family through a friend of mine who's an Iranian exile, and then there was the big question, they agreed and the f to allow someone to go in. The big question was who? All foreign journalists are banned. I've filmed in Iran before, but all foreign journalists are now banned. I wanted to go over the border secretly. I thought about it and thought about it and felt that somebody looking like me walking into the family apartment day after day was a high risk. So after a long search, I found a very, very courageous Iranian journalist who was who was willing to go in, gave him a crash course in filmmaking, 
and bless him, in he went, taking enormous risks, as did the family. And, and, it, and it worked out all right. And do we know, we do know who actually shot her? Do we? Yes, we do. Uh, the people who, uh, at the time of the killing, the crowd got hold of the killer. Um, his ID card has been circulated on, on the net. And uh, HBO legal people said, no, we don't want you to go that far. But uh, he is known. There was a talk of bringing him to a trial, but nothing has happened. Really? This, may, this film could have that impact, I suppose. Although Iranians would never want to raise the case again. Presumably. No, I don't. Yes, I mean the film was first uh, went out in America on right. the on the first anniversary of her death, and it has been seen in Iran. A Farsi version was broadcast by um, Voice of America. Um, during one of the screenings, the the power was cut off in Tehran during the time it was shown, but we've had a huge response of emails, thousands of emails from Iranians really? who've seen it, and that that's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. And so, what is your hope? That what can spring from this, this film? Well, uh, documentary film. I wish I was a fortune teller, but I'm not. Um, we I, that that movement is still alive. Um, one of the problems of the world today is that you can't demonstrators can't dislodge regimes who've got helicopters, um, machine guns, and the rest of it. Um, but I do believe, come the next presidential election all this will open up again. And the opposition in Iran is very, very strong. Very, very strong. Very yeah. strong. Uh, the but so is the government. But so is the government. But fractures in governments is what, in the establishment, is what often happens. And uh, I can see there's now a big tension between the Supreme Leader and Ahmadinejad. Uh, there's something like 2,000 members of the religious fraternity who are in jail. They're major religious figures who are outraged at the way the demonstrators were treated, and our only hope is fracture at the top. And so, what about Neda? Was she had she done a lot of protesting by this particular point? The very interesting thing that I wanted to bring out in this program was that she was non-political. She didn't belong to any organisations. She was like any girl anywhere, but this wasn't anywhere. This was the Islamic Republic of of Iran, and what she didn't share, or what so many girls wouldn't share with her, was her enormous courage. And when it became clearly very, very dangerous for the protesters to go out, after the Friday prayers, when the Supreme Leader really f made the point clearly that anyone who goes out is risking their life, she'd been demonstrating all the previous week with her family. The family decided not to go out, and Nader said, if I don't go out, who will? So did she die in vain? I don't think she did die in vain. And I think that her, that, that image of Neda is one of those most powerful elements in keeping that struggle alive in people's minds. Well, we'll see where it develops from here. Thank you very much for Thank being here. Thank you, David. Andy. And that's it for this week. Um, my thanks to all my guests, Anthony, and all of them. Do join me again in seven days' time for another Frost Over the World, a special program, when we'll be looking back at some of the highlights, the most interesting interviews of the recent months of this year. From Mohammed El Baraday, of course, in Egypt, Tony Blair, who's almost everywhere commuting around the world at the moment, to Alicia Keys and that magnificent actor, Jeffrey Rush. Do join us then. That's one week from now. All the best.